you read the Evelyn Waugh essay, right? Yeah. That little book is a very interesting book, which I found. It was reprinted. It, it was initially printed in the 60s by the London Times. And I think it was uh, the writer for um, James Bond, Ian Fleming, was the one that suggested it. But in the introduction, I thought this was very interesting. He said, um, since the Middle Ages, and especially during the past hundred years, there has been a continuous change in ethical values. As the Catholic Encyclopedia puts it, quote, evolution has revolutionized morality. Sin is no more. The rationalist has replaced the notion of sin, which is an offense against God, by the notion of wrong, which is an offense against one's neighbor or oneself. The effects of this change are apparent even among Orthodox believers in sin. Slave owning, for instance, although not in itself a sin, would certainly be discouraged by moral theologians. And cruelty to animals, again not sinful in the Catholic tradition, uh, in the Islamic tradition it actually is sinful is thought wrong by Christians at any rate in the northern countries. So then he, so that's how he introduces it that, but he goes on to say that, um, that he thinks the modern world could actually benefit from revisiting maybe some of the things that the, uh, the medievals were so concerned about. I don't believe any of it. Okay, well let's, why? If these are generalizations which there is no way to pin down uh, to some degree what he says, you know, that we've lost the notion of the sense of sin, uh, that pathology takes the place of sin. He doesn't say that, but I think he'd agree to that. Right. It's true. But there are lots of people who have a very strong sense of sinfulness. In fact, with young students, that's often a real debility. They're sort of primordially ashamed of something. One has to deal with that. So it seems to me these historical generalizations, they have some truth to them, but nothing you can rely on. Certainly not, it seems to me, in a real conversation about something. What do you, what, uh, do you think he's right? You know, I think, I totally agree with you. I think that the vast majority of people still have a sense of, of uh, sinfulness. But I do think that there is, especially in the social sciences, a desire to remove r religious language from the discussion and make it solely sociological and uh, circumstantial that, that people... There, there's almost a sense that uh, sinfulness is, you're really a victim of, of something uh, that's beyond your control. And like addiction, for instance, is no longer seen as a moral failing, but rather simply um, perhaps even a genetic uh, disposition. Yeah, I, I agree that in the social sciences, that point of view is rife. It's actually wider. One might say that it comes from the intellectuals in general. Thank God, most of us aren't intellectuals. <laughs> so that yeah, is what we share that sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it it seems to me that look, I think the best way is to consult your own soul. I think I know what original sin is, although I have no theological belief in it. But the sense of being in some way aboriginally and hopelessly wrong, I think that's very, that's universal practically. And people who don't have it aren't quite trustworthy. You know, one of the things that um, anthropologists tend to divide cultures into shame and guilt cultures. Um, and and uh, uh, guilt, I think, is from a German word, isn't it? Schuld. Schuld, yeah. Schuld, yeah. Yeah, which, which also has a, a financial implications. A, a sense of debt. Sense of debt, yes. Yeah, and that's what's interesting to me is that the in, in the Islamic tradition, it also has a sense of debt, that, that you owe a debt to, to God. But that's the same in German, yeah. Yeah. In fact, the, uh, the word in Arabic for the day of judgment really means the day the debts fall due. Uh, what is the debt that you incur that is 
if I owe someone money, I know what I have to give them, right. right? Well, I think the idea in our tradition is that everything is on loan to you. It's been gifted to you. And, and with it comes these immense responsibilities. And if you don't use them for what they were intended for, then, then you've wronged yourself. And the Quran quite often says, God did not wrong them, but they wronged themselves. And, and so it's interesting because I think what with these, these uh, so-called deadly sins or the capital sins, they, they really are wrongs both against the self and against others. And, and the Quran actually says, uh, Your oppression to others is oppression to yourself. That makes sense to me. Uh, look, I've been, I don't know if I've, ever told you this, but I'll, I'll confess it now. I do my thinking in the bathtub. So. I think Benjamin Franklin did that also. Oh, really? Well, I'm a good president to that. Uh, and so yesterday I spent several hours in a warm bath and thought out the kind of thing that I found interesting about sin. And here's the first question that came to me. What's the difference between sin and vice. Mm. Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. Vice would be, you know, my understanding of it is vice is the habitus. It would be the, 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 uh, the state. And then sin would actually, so it's, it's more like the universal and the particular. Sin is the actual action that emanates from the habitus, the negative habitus of vice. So these are, you're saying that they're different modes. They're, they're, yeah, one, one is a, more of a state of being, or, 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 or literally, uh, if you look at Evagrius, where we got these um, thoughts from, because he, he first identified the eight, although I think Horace has something, uh, a similar taxonomy, uh, but, but Evagrius, he, he identifies these eight thoughts and, uh, and he has a, a process. The, the first one was a kind of triggering event. And then the triggering led to what he called coupling, was like an internal dialogue. Yeah. And, then, and then that led to a, an ascent, like you, you ascent to the, the thought. And then there, there was what he called a captivity. And then he said, depending on whether you struggled with it uh, and overcame it, uh, would, would depend on whether you actually acted on it. And so the act would be the sin, whereas the, the vice would be the process that led you to it. That's a very different answer from the one I expected. I thought that it might have something to do, but I'm not sure, with uh, the relation to theology, by which I mean that a sin is fundamentally a rebellion against God, and a vice is a propensity for wrongdoing, secular. Well, I mean, that's a perfectly good definition, I think, of both the words. Now, that leads me to another question I thought of. Are you all right with my asking? I, absolutely. You're, I, like I said, you're the master. I'm the apprentice here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, in any f false modesty, trust me. I'm not quite accepting it, but yeah. it's not. No, no, no. The, you, you've, you've been, you've been uh, I mean, I, you're acknowledged by your peers and, and, uh, and by those who have gone also, I think, for, for, for that. Uh, I wanted to ask whether a, a, uh, whether a vice is um, or, or sinfulness it's better to ask in terms of sin. Could it be that the seven sins that we read of uh, are not really a, something evil, but are simply human propensities? Absolutely. Lust is the chief one. It's the yeah. first and the most exciting one, as uh, we're told in, uh, by Evelyn Waugh. And um, he, uh, or is it Dorothy Sayers? I've forgotten. I think both of them would agree on that in any case. Yeah. 
is it uh, um, is it simply a natural propensity that we all possess and therefore to agonize about it as a sin is really to make too much to engage in a kind of spiritual pride. I mean, we've got these tendencies. One might say, so what? Well, I would say, I would say probably that from, 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 a, from a tradition that I'm coming from, and I think also from a tradition that I do know something about. Um, which yeah. you're thinking of the Islamic tradition. And, and I think the Catholic as well. I mean, I, I grew up in it and I spent enough time in it. Um, yeah. But I, I think the, the idea of sin is rooted in the, in the actual Hebrew, Arabic, and the uh, Greek terms for sin, which are all archery terms. So amartia in the New Testament and chatia Missing, missing the mark. Missing the mark. And so I think it gets back to the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle's idea of real goods and apparent goods, that we're always after a good. But, but, and that's why there, these, these capital sins, if you want to call them that, they're not really sins. They're propensities. And, and I think the point, each one of them has a positive uh, aspect and it's there for a reason. So, like envy, the positive aspect of it is admiration, and and envy has been identified as hidden admiration by many. And 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 lust is is for the uh, uh, so that our species continues. Uh, gluttony is so that our bodies are maintained. But but these become perverted loves, and I think that's where the Florentine. I, I think his explanation becomes very useful of seeing them as perversions of love, either love perverted as in the, uh, the, the uh, pride, uh, anger, envy and anger, and then love deficient, which is the one that we're hopefully going to talk some about, which is acedia or tristitia or sloth. I mean, there are different words used for it. And then love excessive. So you have, you have the, uh, the excessive love of, of money, uh, which in 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 the uh, in the New Testament is actually called philargia, right? Which is love of silver, and then and then the excessive love of food, and then the excessive love of flesh. So it's mineral, vegetable, and uh, and animal. <laughs> that's that's neat. But it seems to be Hamza that you're saying that um, there is this kind of super uh, vice or super sin, which is excessiveness. Uh, well, de or deficient. In the case of sloth, it's deficient. Too little or too much, but both in excess of measure. Right, and this is Aristotle, it's moderation, right? Finding that, that middle, because the, missing the mark is either going too far or too short. That means that moderation is the super virtue. I, I think I think absolutely, and, I, and that's why I, I know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I think uh, the Buddha also called his way the middle way. There's a, there's a really interesting story of the Buddha. He had been an ascetic and, and had been this anchorite that wasted his body weight. As you know, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But, you know, he saw this, um, he saw a musician teaching somebody how to tune a sitar. And he said, you don't want to tune it too tight because it'll break, but you don't want to tune it too low because you won't get the tone. So you want to find that middle spot. And, uh, and that, that was his, uh, the beginning of his understanding of finding what Americans call the sweet spot, the sweet spot, tuning the soul. Yeah. Right. But that, uh, that means that the, that all the sins, the collection of sins really stand under one sin, which is not mentioned among them. Which would be what? Well, uh, uh, moderation. Right, excessiveness or deficiency. So, yeah. And why do you think that is? And and they, look, there's a, a question that goes with that. I ask myself whether the kind of wrongheadedness that I think of myself as being prone to 
is mentioned among the seven sins. And I didn't find it there. Which would be, which would be? Well, selfishness, yeah. Well, I th no, I think selfishness is definitely understood to be embedded in, in all of them, particularly acedia. Well, which... that's why, how I came at it, because I don't know yeah. how, I, how I came. I think I was asked to choose, to choose my favorite sin. So I was supposed to be prepared to talk about sloth. Yeah. And, and what's, what's intriguing me, I think, about you is one, I, I, I would absolutely, um, I would completely uh, condemn anyone that would accuse you of sloth because you have had such an incredibly productive life. Although we, we all feel slothful in our own ways, I think, because human beings are incredibly efficient time wasters. But this is what seems to be interesting about sloth. I, I ask myself, how do I get at its nature? And it seemed to me the best way to get at its nature is to find its opposite. That is to say, what is the virtue or the blessing that is opposite to sloth? And the first thing I came on is busyness. But busyness is not a virtue. I think traditionally they would say industria. Industry, yeah. but uh, industry insofar as it is a way of being busy. In other words, if I'm slothful, I'm slow. Incidentally, the first thing I did when I heard that sloth was to be my vice mm -hmm. was to look up the animal called the sloth. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, and he hangs upside down from a tree by, by his claws, yeah. by his nails, and he can hardly walk, and he moves slowly and presumably has a very yeah. slow metabolism. Yeah. Uh, why isn't, why couldn't one argue that the opposite, uh, which is busyness, uh, not in the good sense, industry, because the, uh, Industry has its flaws, clearly, but in it could be interpreted as having a bad sense, namely being busy. Why isn't sloth a virtue? You know, it's it's interesting because I think Evelyn Waugh, one of the things he points out in the essay we both read was that a lot of the world's problems would be solved if people were less busy, that, that uh, busyness has created a lot of problems. Yeah, if, if people stopped and and that's not only doing mistaken and bad things. That's being uh, uh, being virtuous. But this gets to the point where I I think sloth is one of the most misunderstood of the deadly sins, because um, acedia, akedia, which was the Greek for like without care, not caring. Yeah. Like, like, like the teacher who asked the student, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the student responded, don't know, don't care. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's what it uh, is, the negative. And so the idea, if, if you look, there's a, there's a very interesting, I don't know if you've uh, ever read the Antireticos. Do you know that work? No. Mm -hmm. it, w it was a work that Evagrius wrote. He was a very interesting character. Unknown he, to me, yeah. He was an incredible orator and he was very um, charismatic and he was uh, somewhat of a ladies man, I think. And when he was in uh, Constantinople, he fell in love with a married woman, but he was a Christian. So he fled to Jerusalem and he met this very interesting Spanish saint named Melania, the same name as the former first lady. Uh, and uh, so Melania- Meaning the black one. Yeah, she was, she was uh, yeah, dark. And she, uh, she told him, you need to go to the, to the desert you know, to, to purify yourself. Um, but he, anyway, he wrote this book called The Antireticos, which is like um, fighting, talking back, right? And, and uh, so when, the, when, when a person is assaulted with these thoughts, and, and one of them was the, the acedia, so he gave verses, I have the book, it's a very interesting book, but he gave verses to kind of combat the thoughts. And the, and the verse that he gave, the verses that he gave for Acedia 
uh, the, the most important one was, was the, the Shema from, from uh, Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is, is one Lord. And then to, you know, to worship God with all of your heart and all of your soul. So, so that, was, that was really the idea of ascidia, that it was, it was spiritual laziness. And I think they always understood that, that you could be very busy in the world and yet not have worked on your soul. I mean, there's a very interesting... You know, it seems to me that Socrates, in all of the dialogues, he's constantly saying we need to get to work. You know, there's work that needs to be done. And, and, and if we don't do that work, it, he actually finally resorts with Thrasymachus uh, that it's in the afterlife, you know, we're all going to be naked and it's virtue that will determine. I have another one just as good, which is Aristotle's energia as the chief term which means being at work. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And so I think that's really what they were talking about. And I think the idea of being bu busy work, you know, there's a lot of people that are very busy, but they're actually not doing anything. And, and you know, we have this uh, idea of idle, which is a very interesting word uh, and, and almost a homonym with idle. But, you know, we talk about the idle rich, and, or we talk about a car idling, you know, like a car's not going anywhere. It's just idling. And so I think, you know, it, I think that's really what it's about. It's a kind of an emptiness and a meaninglessness. Yeah, which goes, which goes with either doing nothing, but equally goes with being busy, right? I mean, being busy has similar consequences and sometimes more, more harmful. I, I think that's true. I think um, we, we would be certainly, there's a lot of people that wanted to take over the world that were very busy people and, and caused a great deal of, uh, of terror and, and uh, human suffering because of their busyness. Yeah, and we, generally speaking, especially Americans agree to the notion that you've got to grow and expand or you're going to decline. I've never understood the rationale. Why isn't stability a possibility? I think that's more of a spiritual growth. It's, it's like uh, the poet said, uh, he who's not busy being born is busy dying. <laughs> he's, going <to> be, <laughs> he's going to die in any case. So. <laughs> well, it, but is it death into a new rebirth? And, and I know that's a, that's a question that uh, uh, I think distinguishes people that that believe in an afterlife and people that either are agnostic about it or have rejected it entirely. I asked myself, what is the truly opposed virtue or I don't know, what's the opposite word to sin? Sinlessness isn't good enough. I'm I think innocence and purity. Purity. Okay, so what, what is the true opposite of the sin I was assigned, sloth? And it seems to me that the answer is interest. And I've often thought and talked to my friends about it, that lack of interest is the most dangerous uh, vice there is. That generations that can't find something that interests them make war, that the cause of war is absence of interest. That, and I take interest to be uh, etymologically by its root meaning, uh, that it should be taken that way. Caring about something. That it means in the middle of things, inter essa, to be in the middle of things. Right. And if you're not in the middle of things, you're apt to uh, begin to uh, want to st want stimulation, and if you want stimulation, violence first comes to mind, and before long, whole generations long to go to war. For instance, my father, who fought on the German side, oddly enough, in, in World War One, comes from a generation. The literature, pre-war literature, shows they were bored to tears, and they were anxious for something really exciting, really stimulating to happen. And war was exactly what they thought was the cure 
for their ills. So it seems to me that lack of being of interesse, being among things, of having an interest, that, is probably that, the most dangerous thing there is. I, that's a very, I think it's a really profound uh, explanation. And th there's a very interesting poet, uh, 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 Imr al-Qais, he's one of the great Arab poets. But he said, whenever war shows up, it attracts every young ignoramus. Like it's an exciting thing. It's exciting, yes. Young men particularly are prone to it. Um, there's, a, there's a great poem by Robert F Frost um, about, I hear the world reciting mistakes of ancient men, the brutality and fighting they will never have again, heartbroken and disabled in body and in mind. They renew talk of the fabled federation of mankind, but they're blessed with the acumen to suspect the human trait was not the basest human that made them militate. They'll tell you more as soon as you tell them what to do with their ever-breaking newness and their courage to be new. And I think that, you know, he got to the heart that, that because th there are so many virtues associated with war, like courage and, and uh, defending and honor, that it, it was something that would be really difficult to eliminate. But I'll tell you a funny, another poem that I found on Sloth. They, they had a, um, they had this, uh, essay contest to, or poet contest to write poems praising the seven deadly sins. And the one that won for Slaw said, death in his scythe will mow us all. So why waste precious time on toiling? Instead, try to cultivate Slaw's higher form. If sin is lounging by the poolside, let's begin. Tell those who question what you're idling's for, no slothful person ever started war. That's, that's perfect. Who, Whose poem is this? Did you say? I, I don't. I, I don't recall the poet, but it's uh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he, look, if this is a mystery to me, and I should, you know, I have mean, taught at my college for 64, 64 years. Not every year, but I've been there for sixty-four years. Every year, there are students who came here. Their parents pay oodles of money to send them here. They want to be here, that is here at the college studying. And they're not interested. I don't understand it. I don't understand what it is. Partly, it belongs to adolescence to be seized by boredom, not to be able to get out of it. But what? The reason that not understanding it bothers me is books. I've never known how to get kids out of it. You know, they, oh, in every every seminar of ours, where you get to know, we get to know as you do, our students very well. There are always one or two or three, often the apparently brightest, who are simply not interested. They're reading the most interesting books. They're capable of the most interesting observations. They have, I hope, the most interesting teachers, but they're not interested. What is it in human being that makes them lack the desire to be among things? I, I think that's a sedia. You know, I've read a couple of modern books. One was called The Noonday Devil, and the other was a sedia, which was you know, uh, I think a modern crisis or something like that. But, but both of them talked about how really ennui is this this kind of. Uh, I think they called it tedium vitae. Yeah, tedium vitae. That 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 that, that in essence was, um, you know, that 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 was kind of the the problem of our time. And I think Aristotle actually in Book Ten he actually talks about the people that that do not cultivate the intellectual virtues always have recourse to sensual. Uh, delights. And I think that's why our culture seems to be, you know, uh, lust becomes a replacement. It's generally, it's a general experience that uh, whereas the central pleasures have a limit, and you know, after a while you just don't want any more of it, no matter what it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's not true of the intellectual. Exactly. They, uh, you may have to go to sleep and, and uh, you know, recoup your energies, but 
you don't come to a limit of desire. So it's what one wishes students would have that interest. But see, what is it that fails them? They could be, it's not richness, riches or, or poverty. That isn't what makes the difference. It's not an intellect. Uh, it's, I, I don't know what it is. It, it, it's a mystery to me. I, I think partly it's, it's I, I, the way I look at it is we have awakenings in life. And, 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 you know, the first awakenings are obviously the infant awakens to, to, uh, to the sensoria. And, um, and then you have emotional awakenings, certainly the first pangs of experiencing emotional attachment. And I think there is an intellectual awakening that just is deferred in a lot of people. And, and I think there's also a spiritual awakening um, that, uh, that is related to me to the, the intellectual because I really feel, uh, you know, I, I'm very much in agreement with the, uh, the scholastics that, that intellect is a spiritual mode of, you know, that it's, it really is a spiritual um, uh, phenomenon. What is meant by spiritual here? Uh, well, immaterial, that it's immaterial, that it's not of the material world. Is the intellect always spiritual? I, I think if, I mean, certainly if, if you believe in the agent intellect, this idea that we're actually participating. Well, if you believe in, in the intellect as a godhead, then, <laughs> then it's going to be spiritual. I mean, I think the brain, the brain seems to me to be uh, a type of hardware, but it doesn't explain where the software comes from. It doesn't explain how we're having thoughts and, and the fact that thoughts might have uh, some kind of neural activity, but I don't, I don't see it in the same way as you have the cloud and then you have your, 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 your computer in front of you and you pull these things down from the cloud, but where is the cloud? Yeah, it doesn't explain emergence, which is the term that people use to get over the question. You know, they say that, that the intellect emerges from the brain or the spirit emerges from these two pounds of pound and a half of wet flesh. Well, <laughs> that doesn't explain anything. It's a term. You know. So that, that seems to be, uh, for a while, you know, I engaged for a while in what turned out to be sort of fruitless stuff, of reading a lot about neurophysiology and, and there's no answer to these questions. And no, I've never, never read an article by a neuroscientist that said, we may never know. They always say, we aren't there yet. Right. Well, I think a scientist, I mean, that's... They have to, yeah. They have their own faith. And, uh, and I think theologians say, we're going to find out in the afterlife. Scientists say, we're going to find out in the future. So it's, you know, pre priests um, share a lot of things in common, and I think that's one of them. I, I'm still thinking about inter-essay. You know, it's such an interesting idea among, because it seems to me that a lot of what uh, sp spiritual work is, is about getting to the essence, uh, get, getting to our own essence. W one of the things that, to me, acedia in some ways is a loss of self through obsession with the self. And, and I think, I know you're, you're not as much a fan of Kierkegaard as I am, but one of the things that Kierkegaard said, which really impressed me, was he said that one of the most dangerous things in the world is to lose yourself. And he said that, that people can lose their wife or their spouse, they can lose an arm, they can even lose $5 and they'll notice it but they can lose themselves without even noticing it. And I, and I think acedia seems to me to be, it, 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 it's, it's related to that in a sense that people really lose themselves in this kind of meaningless, um, meaninglessness. And that's why one of the daughters of acedia is despair. Which comes first? I think the, the lack of concern comes first.
and then despair sets in. I mean, I, I, you know, if you look at uh, somebody like Macbeth, you know, Macbeth didn't, was not doing any spiritual work. In fact, he was listening to the demons. I mean, the weird sisters were definitely some kind of demonic. Uh, and, and, and his ambition, worldly ambition, uh, took him over. And then he ends up in a, in a state of utter, dis- tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace. He, he's in a, you know, that this is just a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And I think that's where they end up. Whereas if you look at a character like um, Duke Signor in, uh, in As You Like It, he ends up like his, his losing his position becomes an opportunity for spiritual pursuit. And so he's in the, in the, in the, the forest saying that I, I hear t- tongues in trees and books in running brooks and sermons in stones and good in everything. These are very different responses to the world. One is seeking the worldly things. And, and ends up in utter despair. And the other is loses all the worldly things and ends up in a, a spiritual state. Yeah, look, I have, a, a, can I change a little bit? Absolutely. Um, it really goes back to uh, what we were talking about before, the nature of the intellect. Um, is the intellect always guiltless in, uh, in the sort of uh, uh, loss of, of faith and uh, the kind of dismal uh, lack of uh, hope that we were, dis- despair that we were talking about. Uh, or better way to put it is, are there modes of the intellect that invite that kind of thing, namely the mode called rationality? That, that is, sure, say what I mean by rationality? Absolutely. Rationality is what we usually call linear thinking, going right. from here to there in articulable steps, uh, proving, showing your, the dogmas you begin with, ending up with the conclusion, showing what the inferences are in between, whereas the intellect is not uh, so method bound. And it seems to me that rational method or rationality uh, has an aspect to it which is really dangerous. People who are devoted to it lose or forget their humanity. They make a kind of God out of reason. And uh, that seems to me can lead to real disasters. The reign of terror. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. reason was everything. They, they, they made it a god. Reigns of terror often depend on being uh, on rationality. The Germans had their, all their rationality. It was all reasoned out in their minds. And uh, Stalin, uh, Mao. The systems, uh, the people that run themselves by systems, this gets to something really interesting of the virtue of sloth, because part of the problem with these busy people is, is I think the people who have caused the most problems on this planet are people that actually want to change it. Change what? The world. Oh, change the world, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's so horrible. Uh, and this is all, and they end up killing millions of people in pursuit of this. You know, I was, I had a conversation the other day with somebody and, and they were talking about um, just how it's all this evil capitalism and that before capitalism, everybody was living in harmony. It was kind of this Rousseauian view of the world. And I was, I was trying to convince him just that there is a human nature and it seems to me it's pretty consistent. Even, even in Aboriginal peoples, you're gonna find greed and- The notion of the general will is as close to a kind of fascism. I could totally agree with you. What Sir Dorothy Sayers and Evelyn Waugh wrote on the, on the seven sins. Are there people who are experts on sin? I think Dorothy, Dorothy Sayers was. I think they both were. Yeah, I, I think uh, Evelyn Waugh, there's a very interesting story that his son tells him 
uh, tells, wrote about, I think maybe after his father died. But, uh, um, you know, he was, a, he was a corpulent man, Evelyn was, you know. I always imagine him as skinny. <laughs> no, 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 he was quite corpulent. And he had, he had a large family. He was Catholic, had a large family. And uh, apparently in, during the war, there were no bananas. And, uh, and so the socialist government, when it got into power, they issued f for the number of children you had, they would give one banana to each child. And so the, um, the bananas <laughs> came <laughs> and uh, the son, I think his name was Auburn Waugh, he's, who was a writer also, but he said that his father uh, had the, the, the mother put all three bananas for the three children into a bowl and then poured cream, which was also rationed at the time, onto it. And they had to watch their father eat all three bananas. And he said, I could never take seriously any moral um, statements my father made after that. He would be an expert in gluttony thereafter. Yeah. But uh, that bears on my question. Can you be an, a theoretical expert on sin? That is, has everyone sinned so that they can write about it in a convincing way? I've said this before. My dad said by 40, everybody's an expert on at least three of the seven. <laughs> I see. Well, I'm thinking quickly, but I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Good. Neither will I. Uh, well, I told about one, but... I think that's enough. I don't think I, you know, I think envy, I think pride is a, is a big one. And arguably they actually differentiate between superbia and vana gloria. So, so, so they saw superbia as at least in, in Aquinas' schematic, uh, superbia was really the root cause of all sinfulness. Whereas, uh, vana gloria, was the, the one of the seven. It was, it, it was one of the yeah. s seven. Uh, superbia is uh, said in one of the essays to, to be the Latin counterpart of hubris. Right, hubris. Yeah. Why is that the root sin? See, I've heard that the root virtue is courage, and that makes sense to me. The moral, the, yeah, the moral virtue is abs yeah, is courage. Why should hubris or superbia be the root sin? Well, Aquinas said that the, the actual root sin was avaricia, but all sin begins with superbia. In other words, it's, it's only a prideful man that can actually, it's somebody that, that, that sees himself in a certain position, that a humble man will be thwarted uh, from sin by his humility beca because of a kind of closeness to God and, and, and to acknowledging his place in the world. So that hubris means that pri hubris is really a kind of um, su superiority to God. Yeah, it's a self-delusion, and I think, I mean, I, you know the Greeks better than I do, but the, uh, I think that's certainly, that was the great tragic flaw, wasn't it, in all, the, all their characters, was, was this uh, overweening pride. That's what the books say, but I don't think it's what the plays actually, they're, they're very, I mean, one reason one reads the Greek plays is because they're real characters, and they're all yeah, they are real characters. Yeah, and that gets back to rationality and 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 a kind of intuitive uh, knowledge that the playwrights would have had. Here was another uh, bathtub question: <laughs> um, Do we have some sort of what you might call a completeness proof of s the seven? In other words, uh, Dorothy Sayers begins by mentioning a whole uh, oodles of them, other than the seven cardinal sins. Is there some reason to think that those seven are really the cardinal sins, that is the deadly sins? I think um, the way that, that uh, they would look at it is that they're cardinal in that the others hinge on them in the same way you have the, the, the moral virtues. Yeah. It's hard to think of, um, of, of virtues that can't be subsumed under one of the four moral virtues. And, and, and the same is true for the intellectual virtues. The same is true, I think, for uh, the theological virtues. So in the same way that if, 
I mean, part, part of why I thought about doing this was I wrote a book called Purification of the Heart. But then I did an exercise because there, there, there's almost 30 um, diseases that are mentioned in the book. And uh, you mean physical or mental diseases? No, 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 spiritual diseases. But what I found was they all went under one of the seven. They really could be categorized as coming out of one of the seven. And that's why I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a pretty profound, um, I think it's a pretty profound taxonomy for, for, uh, the sources of a lot of our problems. I was, you know, when, when I mentioned the sin that I'm willing to acknowledge, namely selfishness, it's not among the seven, as it seems to me fundamental. Yeah, that, I, I, I think you're, you're right, but I, I do think that they would all, they would say, and this is where you would need an Aquinas to deal with this, because he had these beautiful objections, um, and that would be an objection. I think the way that he would, uh, uh, to deal with it is, is that, that's not really, a, it's not a sin, it's actually a virtue to be selfish. Um, the, the Quran says, save yourselves. You know, it's like when you're on an airplane, it says, first put the oxygen on yourself so that you can help the other person. Don't, don't begin with the other person. And a lot of the world's problems are from people being concerned with everybody else and not really concerning themselves with themselves. So there's a verse in the Quran that says, take care of your own souls and you will not be harmed by other people that go astray. Sounds, it sounds to be a little sophistical. In other words, the, the, the true cases of selfishness are often cases of taking care of yourself so that you may then take care of others. That's not what I mean. I know, but again, it becomes a perversion. Like what the selfishness that you're talking about, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't uh, in any way uh, deflecting from what you were saying. I was saying that like these things, the origin of them are positive things. And I think the origin of selfishness is self-preservation is very important and it's been put in us for that reason. Um, and, and then we do these extraordinary acts of selflessness. But I think that comes from really something deep within the self. It, 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 it doesn't come from, you know, why people do these extraordinary things. And very often they don't know why they did it. They just responded uh, there. And that's, I think, where it's a habitus. It's, it's, it's a virtuous nature that does those things. So I think the, all of them show a type of selfishness. I mean, envy is your, your desiring for yourself goods that belong to another. Um, wrath is your, your desiring revenge uh, when, when you should be desiring justice. That brings up a question we uh, sort of avoided before, but I would ask it now. We said then, and that made sense to me, that uh, the sins are all excesses. What's the connection between excess and perversion? Well, well the, the, the three lower sins, um, pride, envy, and wrath, are, are perverted love. Yes. And then sloth is deficient love. And then the three hot, the, the, the more natural sins of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, desire, acquisitiveness, avaricia, gula, and, uh, and luxuria, those sins are sins of excessive love. So, so out of the seven, you have perverted, and then you have, um, I mean, I know you know all this. That means that the generalization we made before, which seems to me, seemed to me somehow satisfactory, isn't quite right. It isn't that excess defines or is fundamental to all the sins. No, it's not. It's, it's, it can be deficient or like with a, air, with a target. You could be there off to the right, off to the left. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Michael Jordan, the basketball player. And they asked him, what do you think when you miss a shot? And he said, too far, too short, too much to the left, too much to the right. And that's a perfect definition of how we should ethically live. <laughs> yeah. But 
Uh, but see, that's that. What is it that sinfulness is that that is define uh, that defines sinfulness as a group? What are, we've 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 now we've taken back the notion that excess belongs to all of them because you say it belongs to four and the others are are perversions. But is there something? Well, let me ask a more more accessible question. Maybe we can come back to this one later. But um, I had a conversation with a friend a couple of days ago, and. The following uh, issue came up. Did we know any truly evil people? Uh, both of us, uh, he's in his 70s, I'm in my 90s. We've lived through historical periods where real, e really evil uh, leaders of countries were, I mean, just, I, mean I, I was born a, or rather, I lived for nine years of my life under Hitler. Uh, people have been uh, in the Soviet Union, have dealt with Stalin. There's evil there. Uh, I've never met anyone evil. Have you? I have. I've 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 met. I've met several. And. And this took time to discover, or this was written on their faces? Uh, a few of them, I could feel it just being in their presence. And um, if I told you, you would know some of them, but I'll just keep it to myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I've met some people that I was disturbed for days after. And this is different from people who've done bad things. Yeah, no, I think they did bad things because they were evil. I'll tell you a, st a story which is not exactly illuminating, but I, uh, I remember we had a long, long ago a, a conversation or a seminar, I've forgotten, and uh, the question arose, have you ever known anyone who's truly evil? <laughs> and a man in his 50s, uh, I think it was a summer seminar in Santa Fe, uh, he popped up this one, yeah, uh, my mother-in-law. <laughs> that seemed to be a fairy tale. <laughs> I, I, th I think it's, it's, I think there's people that have so succumbed to the dark side of their souls that, you know, we have a tradition that says that there's a, there's a black spot. The prophet said, so a lot, he said, there was a black spot on the heart um, that everybody's born with. And that as you do bad, it grows until it takes over the entire heart. And, you know, I once asked my father, do you think people sign on a dotted line with the devil? Uh, and he said, no, it's a long series of negotiations. Yeah, that's, I, I believe that. But what you said is, it seems to me, is really dis makes it distinctive. You said it was not knowledge of their doing bad things often and uh, uh, regular, even regularly, you said it was something like an exudation? Yeah, it was definitely, you know, I, I've had the great blessing of being with some profoundly, what I would call holy people, you know, like one of them in West Africa who was probably the most devotional human being I've ever uh, been around. I mean, he really was, he was a teacher, but he was in a state of constant devotion. And when you were with him, there were times when you could literally, you'd just go into a state of complete tranquility from just being in his presence. And, uh, and I've, I've felt that with a few different people. I, I think the opposite is true. I think they're very power, you know, the pendulum, apparently when a pendulum uh, swings, uh, if, if you have a large pendulum in, in, amongst a whole bunch of smaller ones, they, they eventually the small ones will entrain with them. And I think just like you have magnanimous souls of good, which we would call saints, I think you also have magnanimous souls of evil. Uh, and, and people fall into their, they, 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 they enter into a state of entrainment with them. And I, and I think they can move people in terrible ways. You think there are many of them? 
I hope not. I mean, I, <laughs> like I said, I've traveled in some pretty strange um, circles just because I, um, so I, I met a lot of very interesting people. Um, but, I, you know, I also, you know, it meant meeting some people that I really felt were just very dark people. Yeah, I've never met anyone like that. And so I asked myself whether they exist. I know they exist both because, as I say, I lived through the through the world they made. So, uh, so I have to believe they exist. But uh, well, I think you've read enough literature too to know that great literature is never melodramatic. I mean, it's you know that that the evil people aren't like a hundred percent pure evil, but they're still evil. You know, the most interesting person who meets that description that I know of is in that four novel sequence called The Raj Quartet by Paul Scott. Yeah, I've never read that. To me, this is the great novel of the last century. Wow. Yeah, I, I really, and I, I think I could defend that. And in it, there is a police inspector called Merrick, and it's clearly intended to be a kind of perversion of the word merit. <clears throat> and the whole book is written with this very close attention to names and, and to settings. And he has that complexity which makes him capable of great deeds of generosity, but he has exactly this exudation of evil. Uh, the hero of the book uh, is put up in a guest house in a room that was previously occupied by Merrick, and he he smells it. Yeah, he can feel it. Yeah, it's such an honor to be with you, and I I, I never want to really talk when I'm with you because, I mean, even though you, you ask a lot of questions, but um, I really I you know I I've read enough of your your works, and I, I just it it it's amazing to me that somebody like you could be in our midst and not be much more known. You, you've written some really interesting, I mean, the topics that you've grappled with to me seem to be very neglected topics. And, and I really appreciate that. The topic of negation is a fascinating one. And I think in some ways, acedia was seen as a negation of joy, you know, that you were negating the, the joie de vivre that, that God really created us to experience. That set me off in asking particularly about the sin I was assigned, sloth, but about the other sins, what the negations of those sins were. And uh, the, the problem there was that some of the negations were worse than the sin. For instance, what's the negation of lust? I mean, that strike you as desirable? If the world were without lust, again, again, it. I think you know, love is so important in in uh, in, in in intimacy, and if if it's absent, then then it just becomes a bestial. But there's got to be some aspect of lust and love, or it's sort of like uh, two percent milk. You know. No, I, it's a good point. I mean, God has obviously put these things in us to attract us to one another so that the species continues. I mean, that's, I think, how it would be, be, be viewed. And, um, and pride. Um, the, t I know that humility is a Christian virtue. I don't like it. Well, Nietzsche would, Nietzsche would agree with you on that one. I think the ancient Greeks would, too. They, they didn't really, they saw the magnanimous was the great souled one. Megalo, what do they call it? Psychomegala? What? Megalosuchia, yeah. Yeah, Megalosuchia, yeah. We have a great teacher, uh, Ibn Atayla, who said, if you see your humility, you're not humble. And so when people say, in my humble opinion, <laughs> it's but, like a negation. Hamza, it's worse than that with me. I think the very notion of being close to the ground, you know, which is what humility, I think, implies, you know, uh, near the humus. Yeah, humus, right. That there's something about that, that a human being shouldn't have to agree to. 
Modesty is a great virtue, right. but humility seems to me exactly to have the sort of excess that turns a virtue into a vice. Well, it's related to humiliation as well. I mean, I think, yeah. yeah. And, and obsequiousness certainly is a perversion of it. The great character that Dickens created, you know, Uriah Heep. <laughs> I'm so very humble. Yes. <laughs> that really seems to me sort of the residual wisdom in looking at the, uh, in thinking about the uh, sins, which is that their opposites are not necessarily virtues. They could be vices, and that uh, it's more, uh, there's a complexity there that speaking of vices and virtues and sins and purity doesn't quite catch. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that has to do with the fact that uh, the negations of those, uh, of those virtues and vices are not necessarily uh, we're so better than the uh, than whichever one we start with. Is that the same? I, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, you know, if we go back to the, the ancients, they clearly saw that the that a virtuous man or woman would be, I mean, if they if they uh, if they entertain that thought, but a virtuous man, um, was 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 a good man and and therefore a happy man, whereas the vice, they it, it would lead to a kind of unhappiness. It was inevitable in their in their understanding, and one wonders. Um, it seems to be if if you interpret happiness as it is today, a lot of people feel that happiness is in the vices. That you know, in that case, it seems to me there is a straightforward. Um, solution to that uh, mistake, which is that they're mistaking pleasure for happiness. Right. But the really interesting question seems to me to be whether it's actually true that a vicious person, that is a person of vice, is unhappy. Doesn't, I don't know if it's true. Uh, could, couldn't one be joyfully Bad. I think there's a, a, a plenty of um, revenge films that would indicate that. Yeah. yeah. And and I think that there there is a kind of Schadenfreude that that uh, one cathartically experiences with a revenge uh, novel or film or something. <laughs> it's it's still. I mean, there's guilty pleasures undeniably, but I think. If we look at the idea, like in our tradition, Sa'ada is really an otherworldly state. So happiness is, you can be a miserable per person in this world and be happy in the next world. And, and the opposite is true. Um, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad said towards the latter days, the happiest people, he said, As'adun nas, the happiest people would be the lowest people. You know, not having any virtues or anything. Yeah, there's a Christian tradition that the poor are going to be get an extra reward in the next world. Yeah. One would hope. I I don't know. At my expense, I wouldn't want. I mean, if there's enough to go around. No, no, it wouldn't be at your expense. Certainly, yeah. Um, anyway, I you know it's it's an interesting. I, I think about acedia. Um, it's 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 fascinated me for a long time, um, and 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 I, I've given it a lot of thought. And one of the things that you said um, actually troubled me a little bit was that you found it difficult to awaken that in 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 your students. And it seems to me I always thought that it was a great teacher, and I know you are a great teacher. And but I always thought that it was a great teacher that could that had a better chance at doing that. Than I anybody. thought that too, and it taught me something. Yeah, and but uh, there are there may be colleagues who can do it. Often it involves finding the right book and getting the student to read it. That that sometimes does it. You know, someone discovers the book of their life, 
and suddenly the world becomes intelligible. Um, sometimes they do it for the love of the teacher. Uh, sometimes they just uh, they just get over adolescence, you know, and uh, and suddenly find their feet, and the world becomes interesting to them. Uh, sometimes it's a love affair that goes right. You know. So it can be all kinds of things, but. Uh, Preaching <laughs> doesn't do it. Actually, our, uh, you know, the uh, Annapolis is built in a very interesting way. It's got church circle tangent to state circle, which is supposed to express something. Mm -hmm. And church circle is uh, has our Episcopalian church on it, which is the founding church. And, and I heard a very interesting, uh, uh, but uh, interesting sermon there. But was theologically knowledgeable, so one learns something. But being preached at, I don't know, in one year or the other. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think the Prophet Muhammad said the best sermons are the shortest. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that, that they're, they're not meant to be, uh, you know, to be long. They, they should be very short and and I think, um, unfortunately, you know, they say don't give a teenager a telephone and don't give a preacher a microphone. Or, for that matter, a pulpit, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think, that, I think there's a lot of truth to it. I, I, I have to say I've been guilty of a long sermon in my day, so. You know, it seems to me that there actually is a relation of what we've now been talking about, which is length of speech making uh, to... Uh, uh, the question of sin. There's something to my mind, something sinful about abusing uh, speech by copiousness. That uh, uh, language wants to be, language demands brevity, brevity and that a much lengthiness is the result of the fact that you don't know what you're doing, and so you don't know when you're finished. That is, when people give long speeches, it's very often because they have no, uh, they haven't, their beginning is nowhere, they don't have a middle, and therefore they don't know how to find the end. Well, there's a, a famous story of Winston Churchill was asked how much he charged for a uh, speech, and he said, how long? And he, he said, um, uh, an hour. Uh, no, no, he said uh, 20 minutes. And he said uh, uh, 100 pounds. And he said, how much do you charge for an hour? And he said, 10 pounds. And the man said, I don't understand. He said, I could do an hour speech right now. He said, 20 minutes would take me a long time to prepare for it. So, mm -hmm. so there, there is a real relation between sin and copiousness of, of a certain kind. It's, yeah. it's a sin against language to, to talk endlessly. Yeah, which I think um, brings us to our conclusion. That's a good note to... <laughs> it's a good, good place to stop. <laughs> to it was on. lovely to talk to you. No, it's always such a pleasure, uh, Dr. Eva. You, you really are genuinely one of my favorite people, and, uh, and we're so blessed to have you among us. And I, I, hope, I hope people, you know, just the people that see this uh, get exposed to you. And Thank you so much for inviting me to it yeah. and for letting me talk, think about sloth. That turned out to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you ask great questions, and um, you always stimulate me to think about things at a deeper level. Oh, God bless you. Yeah. Thank you.